to, before I do any reading in the book, I'll just describe for those who haven't read the book. So has, has, I mean, you've read the book. Have you read the book? No. No? Oh, okay. I don't know you. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll begin by saying uh, that this is a rather extraordinary biography in which um, the, uh, uh, the subject of the biography is not at all famous. In fact, he uh, died relatively unknown. He did get a, an obituary in the New York Times when he died, but really only because he did a memoir of his friendship with Gertrude Stein and Alice Tocqueville. Um, very interesting character who was born in southeastern Ohio in 1909. He uh, was pretty much uh, uh, raised by his aunts in, uh, in southeastern Ohio and in Columbus. They ran a boarding house. They didn't have much in the way of money. He attended Ohio State University, graduated by Beta Kappa, um, and became a university professor, teaching first out west in Montana and then Washington State, then for the majority of the teaching career in um, Chicago, where he taught at Loyola University and DePaul University. At a certain point in his career, in the mid-1950s, he left teaching at the university to become instead something that he'd already been doing for quite some time, which was tattooing. Um, even as a university professor, he taught himself to tattoo and then begun tattooing sailors in the Chicago area. Um, and uh, in making the transition to uh, this more interesting way of life, he also had more free time to keep extensive diaries and journals of his very active sex life, um, as well as to donate huge amounts of material, including photography and uh, statistics, to Alfred Kinsey, who was at that point uh, uh, working on his landmark sex research on so sexual behavior in the human male and sexual behavior in the human female. So Sam's life consisted of a number of different compartmentalized reality. University professor by day, tattoo artist by night, um, uh, uh, sort of a mild-mannered and sexless person in the university environment, and at the same time, uh, in his nighttime incarnations, a man who had a very, very active sex life. Um, his writing life also was highly compartmentalized. So while he was doing his academic research and lecturing to students, he was also uh, keeping uh, secret and very detailed diaries of his sex activities, uh, writing uh, very heartfelt poetry of his emotional involvement with men who were not interested in him for the most part, and uh, also writing fiction about various kinds of um, sexual awareness uh, at different uh, levels of society. By the time he died in 1993, he had published not only uh, a novel um, that had been hailed in the New York Times in the late 1930s as um, worthy of comparison to Virginia Woolf, uh, but also a collection of poems, uh, a social history of tattooing in America from the 1950s and 60s, a memoir of his friendship with Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas, his memoirs, a brief uh, book of memoirs, and uh, what nobody really talked about uh, even in his um, obituary was his uh, output as a homophile journalist writing for the early uh, gay liberation magazines that were published overseas in Switzerland and Denmark, and then later in the United States, um, but also his work as a trailblazing pornographer uh, writing under the name of Phil Andros. So we actually have a fellow here who published with him when he said was publishing as Phil Andros. I'm very happy to have him uh, with us this afternoon. So what I'm going to do is read three sections from Sam's life. We're going to start with um, his childhood experiences growing up in southeastern Ohio in a very uh, sexually naive uh, town uh, uh, and watch him as a young boy making his sexual discoveries and, um, and sort of, uh, uh, settling onto a path which will uh, involve writing about and thinking about sex for most of his life. Then I'll talk a little bit about his um, uh, conflicted life as a university professor and tattoo artist. And then I'll read from a section as well about his departure from uh, DePaul University um, uh, in 1956. So, starting first. Uh, as I think, as, as I mentioned, Sam was raised by his aunts, but his father had been an alcoholic and drug addict who was unemployed, and his mother died when he was very, very young. So his father put Sam and his sister up pretty much out with uh, his his sister, his wife's sisters uh, to be raised at the, at the boarding house. Out of the double loss of his mother and father, 
one loss permanent and abrupt, the other ongoing and perpetually inconclusive, Stewart seems to have accepted from a very early moment that his life's essential condition would be one of loneliness and exclusion. Deprived of parental love and recognition, he would grow up expecting very little love from others. Likewise, having experienced very little touching, warmth, or affection as a child, he would eventually find that prolonged physical intimacy made him extremely uncomfortable, and that those who expected the same from him were destined for disappointment. He would grow up to be a very sociable man, highly skilled at managing and seducing others, but unable to cope with everyday closeness. As a boy, he did his best to fit in, but at the same time, he spent a good deal of time by himself. His preferences for solitude eventually led this gifted young boy to develop a rich private fantasy life, one in which he thought of himself as someone special, separate, and apart. Growing up under the watchful eyes of spinsters, Stewart had known that sex was wrong long before he knew what it was. He, he later remembered, only half jokingly, that, quote, in my little sheltered uh, Methodist way, the talk of sex caused me much agony. The slightest brushing of my hand against my penis was not only a religious sin, but would lead to blindness and pimples, kidney disease, bedwetting, stooped shoulders, insomnia, weight loss, fatigue, stomach trouble, impotence, genital cancer, and ulcers." Unquote. In fact, he so deeply internalized his aunt's great fear of sexual filth that, he unintentionally, that the unintentional discovery that his foreskin could retract and the sudden sight of his filthy crusted blondes shocked him so deeply that he passed out cold. Not surprisingly then, Stewart experienced a series of significant physical and emotional upsets as his body entered puberty. Sexual thoughts and desires began to surface within him, despite his best efforts to exclude them from consciousness. It was at roughly this time that he began to engage in various forms of aggression and bad behavior, including pranks and practical jokes. As a result, he wrote, the meek, mild little mama's boy, the potential sissy, may have remained that on the outside, but inside there was a curious change to a 12-year-old devil. Stewart later wrote that he could recall no real concern among the adult population of Woodsfield about the sex games he and the other boys in town sometimes played, at least insofar as these games might potentially cause them to develop into homosexuals. He credited this lack of concern to a simple, widespread disinclination to discuss sexuality in general, and on top of that, an almost complete culture-wide ignorance about the existence of homosexuality. Here's Sam reading, uh, writing. Midwest American views on homosexuality in the 1920s were very quaint and were based on the assumption that all people raised in civilized Christian countries knew better than to fall in love with or bed persons of the same sex. Knowing better, then, the fundamentalist mind made two breathtaking leaps into logic. People did not do such things, and therefore such things must be non-existent. This kind of thinking protected us all during the 1920s and 30s. Though one might be teased for being a sissy, no one could believe that any person actually engaged in the abominable sin. We lived under the shadow and cover of such naivety. Thus, while Stewart recalled many injunctions against sin in his religious upbringing, both in church and at home, he recalled no specific early injunctions against homosexuality. Through his own investigations, however, Stewart soon ascertained that sexual acts between men were not only strictly illegal in Ohio, but also punishable by incarceration. In his unpublished memoirs, he concludes the story of his first non-masturbatory sexual experience with another boy, a big guy football player who had convinced him to engage in an act of oral sex that was over in less than two minutes, by going on to note that the punishment for such activities in Ohio at that moment so far exceeded the crime as to make the whole situation absurd. So began my criminal life, then punishable by the laws of the state of Ohio at that time, by about 20 years of imprisonment, I guess, each time. Total incarceration in Ohio, between five and 6,000 years. <laughs> um, Stewart had enjoyed the encounter with the football player. And as a result, he subsequently provoked similar encounters with other, usually older, better developed boys in locations all over Woodsfield, in the town graveyard, in a neighbor's attic, in the courthouse bell tower, and even in the same room at the Methodist church where his father taught his Sunday Bible class. Since Stewart usually proposed and initiated these activities, he felt no sense of coercion by the older boys. Rather, he considered himself unique. And here he is reading again from his memoirs. I figured I was put in that town just to bring pleasure to the guys I admired. In that small, about 350 students, high school, the word got around quickly enough, and I think they all came to look on me as a dandy substitute for their girls. I felt different from those boys. Superior, in a way, because I could give them something they wanted and needed. I thought I was the only one, and grew somewhat proud that I could satisfy these boys, most of whom I looked up to and admired because they were my adolescent heroes. And they, in turn, treated me with a funny kind of respect as if they knew that if they made me mad, they wouldn't get any more. I, I was not patronized or made fun of. In those far gone days, everything seemed natural. 